weekend on Yuga Bear land. All Saints Anglican School would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of this land. We honour and respect the elders, past, present and emerging, and their traditional methods of caring for their country. We also wish to acknowledge those of our Indigenous brothers and sisters who wish to share their knowledge for the sustainable care of their country. Hi everybody, I'm Chelsea McLean. I'm the Sustainable Schools Network's Circular Economy Education Coordinator and I'm very pleased to be introducing today's session. For the past few years, I've worked as a volunteer in my two children's primary school on resource recovery projects like soft plastics recycling to earn a buddy bench for our school, as well as lots of composting and worm farming. And we also introduced the container deposit um, scheme, scheme containers for change, which has already earned our school quite a few thousands of dollars um, that were being, uh, that's being put to great use now. I did feel like a bit of a lone soldier at my school though, and I was so happy when I met Katie, Erin, and the others at SSN, because I have found my tribe with them, and I'm so pleased that there are other parents around in the local community who care about the same issues as me. The eldest of my two children has just started a high school program in STEAM, which is Science, Technology, Enterprise, Arts, and Maths at his school. And uh, there's nothing that I find more exciting than seeing young people like him taking the lead when it comes to innovation. And I'm certain that it's our young people who will lead us towards a circular economy by innovating ways that we can keep resources circulating for longer at their highest value. The SSM believes it's really important to involve parents in the sustainability education process and for me, being a parent means encouraging our children to be involved and take the lead around these important issues. It's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our three speakers today. Irfan Deliri is an author and social change consultant making great waves around the world. And he's going to share with us about raising humanity and how we can support passionate young people. Larissa Rose is Director of the Glowing Green Australia Consultancy and her and her team are doing some amazing work with the schools locally. Today Larissa is going to share with us about the important role that parents have to play in enabling a changing school culture. And then Liesl Hull from Suez is going to talk to us about practical ways that we as parents can take action, particularly around resource recovery and reduction. South East Queensland is a biodiversity hotspot that the whole world sees as precious. In our relatively small area of land and sea lay natural wonders beyond the wildest of imaginations. Ancient subtropical rainforest, the world's largest sand islands, rich gum woodlands, mighty estuaries and rivers, and a coastline of nearly 1,000 kilometres. These ecosystems are home to over 4,000 species of native plants and over 1,400 species of native animals. However, this area is also home to us. Indeed, South East Queensland is the most populated region of our state and sadly our impact here has been staggering. Today around 20% of native species are at imminent risk of extinction and our clearing of their habitats has recently been on par with that of the Amazon speeding up at a rate that is pushing nature to the edge. So what can we do? In 2017, Nature Pacific began Back From The Brink, the first venture of its kind to showcase a series of short films about South East Queensland's most threatened plants and animals, what is happening to them and how we can help save them from extinction. From giant orchids to hammerhead sharks, the series delves into tangible actions and projects each and every one of us can take part in to support and celebrate these species. 
Without the hard work of the visionary people behind these projects, the future of our native plants and animals, and of ourselves, hangs in the balance. It is often not that people don't care about the natural world, the animals and plants we lose. It is more that people don't know we're losing them. So many of us imagine extinction as an issue for other countries. Few of us know the chilling reality that it is taking place right here, right now, in our own backyard. For the sake of the generations that lay before us, it's time we empowered ourselves with the knowledge, the know-how and the actions to change the way we care for South East Queensland. A global biodiversity hotspot and a home for us all. And now, it's our great pleasure to introduce Irfan Deliri. Irfan is an author, poet, activist and social change consultant with over a decade of experience across participatory development, youth empowerment, settlement services, community engagement and human rights advocacy. Irfan is particularly passionate about empowering youth from diverse communities in working towards gender equality, environmental protection and sustainability, social harmony and economic justice. Raising Humanity is Irfan's latest book and it talks about the underlying causes of inequality and establishing pathways to socio-economic justice. As an internationally toured spoken word artist, motivation speaker and resilience trainer, Irfan seeks to further the discourse on the connection between eco-psychology, economy and social harmony. Irfan's the founding director of Newkind Social Justice Conference, advisor to Amnesty International Australia, and he holds a Master in Communication for Social Change from the University of Queensland. Please welcome Irfan and we can't wait to hear what he has to say. Hi, it's me, Erfan. Uh, for those who don't know who I am, I am the founding director of Newkind Social Justice Conference. I am a social change consultant uh, with a master's in communication in social change from UQ. Uh, I am a youth educator and I also happen to be a spoken word artist and the author of the book Raising Humanity, uh, which is a book that connects uh, a bunch of themes together um, and presents a new way forward with regards to social change and creating a more just and sustainable world. Uh, I'm really stoked to be invited to speak as part of the Sustainability Symposium and I've been asked to touch on a few of the themes specifically relating to youth education and the role of youth in creating a more just, sustainable and equitable world. To begin with, I wanted to start with something that's really um, become very clear and evident to me um, over the course of the last 17 or 18 years that I've been working with youth is that when it comes to creating positive social change in the world, there is no more effective means of creating change than the care, the protection, and the education of young people. Um, we often tend to want to create change in a very rapid fire way. We have these very um, linear modes of thinking like this particular election time frame or this particular social movement will create the lasting change that we need and we want things to happen really quickly and that makes sense because the urgency of the situation requires us to to work with um, a certain rate of change that's required of us but we often overestimate what we can achieve in a single year and we underestimate what we can accomplish over the course of 10 years um, and this is where youth education comes into play um, the situation that we're in at the moment the social inequalities, the environmental inequalities, um, the economic injustice that we're faced with 
uh, won't be fixed in a matter of months or a couple of years. These are systemic issues that have come out of uh, a lack of intelligent systems design. Um, and there is no end to injustice um, within a system that's been designed to maintain uh, positions of injustice. What we require is a full systems change and the biggest contributing factor in systems change in our particular case is the education of young people. So if you're involved in the education of youth, if you are involved in parenting or the care or protection of youth or children in any way, shape or form, there is no more critical and effective means of creating lasting change. And this is something we often overlook uh, while we're out there trying to save the world, while we're advocating or, or becoming involved in activist movements, we as parents or as adults often uh, forget that we are literally, as I outlined in the book, raising humanity in our own living rooms. Um, and that's part of the reason why we've got the title of Raising Humanity for the book. The other part is that the process of education, um, the process of social change are both interconnected in that we can't create social change, true and lasting social change, if we don't actually come at it from a perspective of education, i.e. educating humanity. So we are both raising humanity uh, in our children, in our homes, and we also need to be taking an approach of educating our fellow peers and the wider community when it comes to our tactics for creating change. Um, raising awareness is often one tactic that we've employed, believing that simply by increasing the information that is available to people will somehow adjust their behavior. And the academic research clearly proves that this is not the case. Uh, raising awareness is not an effective means of creating behavioral change. So it's more akin to a process of education that's what, what we require to be able to actually change behaviors. If you just increase what people know and assume that they're gonna behave differently, that's a really naive way of looking at it. Um, human beings once were thought to be very rational beings and would act on the information available to them, but it's actually been proven now that we're not very rational at all. We're actually very emotional beings. Um, and it takes a lot of complex uh, emotional techniques to be able to create lasting behavioral change. Which brings us back to our point uh, of youth and childhood education. Much of the injustice that we're seeing in the world right now, much of the imbalances, much of the toxicity that's playing out in our social political spheres um, could have been mitigated had there been a different way of educating our children at a certain age. Every issue that we're facing out there um, can be educated out of society when we give our children the attentive presence that they require. We've used education um, in the past as a, as a means to an end, as a, as a way of getting from one stage to the next, to the next, to the next, in a very mechanistic kind of way. You finish your primary school just so you can get into a good high school. You get good grades in high school just so you can get into a good university. You get good grades at university just so you can get into a good job. Um, and this sort of linear mechanistic way of treating education as a means to an end um, is part of the reason why we live in such a dysfunctional society. Um, the, the process itself um, is the end in a way. Um, and the attentiveness and the presence and the attention that still adults seek in their adult life um, is what's required uh, in early childhood education. That presence of a parent who truly genuinely cares to listen to the stories, the questions, to, to comment on the finger paintings of the child, that type of presence that we give our children when they're young and cute needs to be maintained throughout their childhood um, into their youth um, and into their adult years. Because as I've discussed in the book, the injustice that we see, the social inequalities, the systems of oppression, the fear and prejudice that's, that's within our society right now, that's at the root of much of the environmental damage we're creating as well, and much of the conflict and the wars across our countries as well. And this stems from feelings of disconnection and feelings of inadequacy that were seeded in our childhoods um, because the parents are either busy trying to put foot on the table and a roof over their heads, or the teachers who have simply had too many students in the classrooms and just had to get them from one grade to the next, um, weren't able to give children the, the, the proper attentiveness required um, to be able to develop certain characteristics of fearlessness and courage and altruism uh, and care for, for others. 
Um, and what we focused on instead was the, the literacy skills, the arithmetic skills, um, and the things that were being tested on the marks. So when we begin to offer uh, our children um, the attentiveness that they require, that all human beings really require, it's like water to plants. Um, it, 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 they thrive off of it. And if they don't get it in those early years, our, our modes of thinking become affected later on. Um, and those lacks or inadequacies or feelings of disconnect later on play out in adult, adult life. And that comes out in our policy making, it comes out um, in our marketing, it comes out in, in our, all of our workplaces and in our interpersonal relationships. Um, and as much as we think that there are some really big, large scale global issues that we have to address right away and it takes politicians immediate action, um, it's also a bit naive to think that these systemic global changes can happen if we don't pay attention to the details uh, within the system that kind of lead to this. Um, the earth in all of its ways, in both natural and, and social ways, is a slowly moving um, uh, ecological ecosystem in, in all regards, both in a natural sense and as well as human society sense. And it moves slowly and evolves slowly. And it's paying attention to those slow moving, slow changing cogs in the system that will actually create lasting change. Um, as much as our sense of urgency wishes for everything to be perfect right this minute, it's long-term change that we actually require and it's committing ourselves to long-term tasks like the education of children that will get us there. Now what happens when this is done? As we are seeing already the effects of slightly more evolved parenting over the last decade or two has led to a generation of teenagers now who are more resilient and more aware of global social justice issues, environmental issues, economic issues, gender issues than potentially any previous generation ever. And that's um, going to only continue to evolve as we continue to give more attention um, to childhood education. The youth of every generation, of every society are always at the forefront of, of being able to um, pick out the incongruencies within our society to be able to find the, the nuances where we still need to kind of evolve in. And that's what's been shown to us by our, by our youth right now. The climate movement uh, generation is being able, is showing us how one issue can bring the entire world across race, across gender, across nationality, uh, across ideology together. All over the world, youth that don't even speak the same language, to be able to advocate for a single cause. So, when previous generations, three or four or five generations ago, could not have imagined the entire world as a single um, moving, evolving organism as one, we are now being shown by our, by our youth um, very clearly how we are a, a single entity uh, existing in a single home. Um, and as we continue to um, give voice to the youth and allow them to lead us, um, we'll see our societies evolve further and further into more just, sustainable, equitable societies. Um, what the, one of the other final points that I want to make is that the human being is inherently good, kind, gentle and calm and inherently wants to do good. Um, this is part of our, our innate nature and we are only able to do so or we only tend to do so when we are free of fear. We are supremely intelligent beings. We have systems thinking tendencies embedded within us, which is, which is why we've kind of been able to develop the society around us. And that intelligence, that altruism, that care for society, that care for others comes out when we are free of fear, when we are feeling safe. When we are feeling afraid or unsafe, what happens is we tend to close ourselves off, the heart shuts down, and that flow of intelligence kind of stops there as well. So this is another reason why being able to care for, protect and educate children and youth in their earlier years allows that intelligence to really come through. And as we continue to create safer spaces for children to be able to grow and extend further limbs, then they will truly be able to show to us that innate intelligence that is in all of us. So uh, not only do we need to be able to 
give that sense of safety and care and protection to children, but also in raising awareness, whether it's with regards to climate change, whether it's regards to gender inequality, whether it's regards to economic injustice, if we're able to create that sense of safety and remove the, the, the tension and the fear in our conversations and even in our awareness raising campaigns, then that innate intelligence will, will stream through us um, that will then lead to more intelligent design, more intelligent policy, more intelligent social structures within our societies. So I, I realize I've only got about 10 to 15 minutes with you today, so I'm gonna end this particular talk here and I might record a second talk for you as well um, so I can continue on the same themes that we've just touched upon here. Thank you so much for listening and for allowing me to be part of the Sustainability Symposium. I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. I'll speak with you soon. Peace. When I see you, I see perfection. I see beings of light brought to life through love. I see a reflection of myself. I see God resting in the corners of your mouth as you point them towards the sky. Why don't you smile more often, child? Why don't you smile? If only you could see the beauty that I see when I look into your eyes. For in your very breath is the vastness of the universe and all of its skies. And God, she swims in your tears as they run down your face. And God loves the sound your heartfelt laughter makes. For God, she is the breeze who dances with your hair. And God, he is the rain who washes away all of your cares. So let your hair out, my love. Let me watch it dance with the breeze. Look with joy to the clouds that watch us from above. Imagine the beauty they see. If only for a moment, when you turn your face to me. For my heart, it aches for you. I know that all you've ever wanted was to feel wanted. And I tell you now that you are so much more than you think that you are. You are a wish that someone has placed upon a star and one day you will find that person. And when you do, you will realize it was always yourself. For now, just remember that you are loved and adored. You are missed even when you are near and God, she is never far. He's looking at you every time you turn your face to the mirror. So clear yourselves of your fears and you will see life a little clearer. You see, with every fear you manage to overcome, your heart will expand a little bit more and it's able to carry a little bit more love until it can fit the entirety of the world. And when you do that, you will realize that this was all you. This was all us. We did this. We created this universe just for fun. And the time is now approaching for us to once again be as one. I've been working with youth from different backgrounds, different cultures, different nationalities, different stories for about 17 or 18 years now. I've worked with ex-child soldiers who have been rescued by aid workers from Sudan. I've worked with the survivors of trauma and abuse. I've worked with indigenous communities in remote parts of the country, um, in Mapun, Arakun and Arnhem Land. I've worked with refugee children who have been resettled into this country. I've worked with all sorts of different groups over the last 17 years. And one of the most crucial fundamental learnings that I have gained over the course of these last 17 years that has been applicable in every one of these situations now that I look back, it actually stems from the very first experience that I had in my involvement with working with youth. At the time, I was still only 17. And I wasn't by any means a youth worker um, or had any realization of what was going to happen down the track. But I was 17 years old and my father, who was at the time and still is the director of the Townsville Intercultural Center, called me into a meeting, a meeting with four or five other adults who are three times my age at the time, about a youth engagement project that they were um, looking to implement in the local community at the time. And as a 17 year old, I was asked to come into this meeting to give my advice, my thoughts and feedback, and if I had any ideas for changes to the, uh, the outline of, of this project that I wanted to do. And I didn't realize it at the time, but being asked to come into that meeting as a 17 year old, who was still just trying to, who'd only just finished high school in fact, 
to give feedback and advice uh, and to share my thoughts on a project that was designed for people of my age and younger had a lasting impact on me. The thought that my opinion mattered, the thought that my ideas were worth something, um, the way that my ideas were received and taken note of, um, purely because of the fact that there was a level of respect there for me. That had an impact on me that now that I look back has influenced me in all of the outrageous and courageous decisions I've made in the last 17 or 18 years since that day. And then from there, I began working as a volunteer in, in many youth development projects. Um, I eventually went to university to do my master's in communication for social change and continued to work in all those projects that I mentioned earlier with so many different diverse groups. Then being asked to reflect back on how I ended up where I am today, that memory sticks out. It turns out that that moment in time in my life where I was brought into a room of adults twice or three times my age and asked my opinion and my thoughts as if they actually mattered, and I was listened to and I was heard, it had an impact on me. Not necessarily uh, guiding me to work with youth, but bringing me the, the courage, the self-confidence um, that I needed to be able to go out there and do some of the courageous and outrageous things that I've done in the last 17 years. Turns out I ended up working with youth and over the course of the next 17 years, I realized that in each and every one of those cases, as I gave back to those youth, that same moment that I was given when I was 17, whether they're 15 year olds or 25 year olds, as I gave them that same experience, I saw their eyes light up. I saw their courage come back. I saw them open up and I was able to be uh, to to work and interact with young people in a way that teachers and um, youth workers and uh, even um, prison workers weren't able to quite understand how in 30 minutes or 40 minutes I was able to get such a depth and breadth of uh, involvement from these youth. And it goes back to that idea of being given the attentiveness and the presence that we all still crave. And when we don't get it, there's all sorts of dysfunction that comes out of that. But when we're given that I the idea and still is in, in us that our thoughts matter and our opinions are worthy and that our ideas, as outrageous as it might seem, have some worth, that changes a person. And then the idea of changing the world out there isn't so absurd to them. Then it becomes surmountable. Things that we look at, well, like that's just the way things are, and we can't change that, all of a sudden become very possible merely because of that little bit of faith that, that person has in them. And this is one of the most foundational principles and lessons that I've learned over the last 17 years. So as parents, as educators of youth and children, as youth workers, I urge you, beyond all of the theory, beyond all of the academic learning that people need to, to receive, beyond every other um, nourishment that youth need to, to grow and develop and become courageous adults who take on the challenges of this world, the attentiveness and presence that, that we still crave as adults has a lasting impact. And as a 37 year old now, I can look back and I can pinpoint that particular moment where my life was dramatically shifted uh, for me to now be in a position where I am now, where I speak regularly, where I write books and I, I go out there and I try r ridiculous ideas of, of, how, of how we can change the world. This is what youth really want. This is what they really crave. This is what you as a parent or a teacher can truly give them that you might not realize the impact it's having until decades later. Thank you. Glowing Green Australia is a Gold Coast based environmental consultancy company specializing in environmental assessments, auditing and education. Our partnership with local universities provides industry placement internships for students. We have a dedicated focus and strong commitment to deliver sustainable and environmental solutions. In consultation with the client, we determine what risks exist and then provide realistic, relevant and cost-effective strategies that comply with any social, economic and environmental governance. 
Our auditing and environmental education initiatives deliver sustainable programs throughout schools across Australia. Our team work to deliver engaging programs from early learning through to Year 12 that link to curriculum-based learning outcomes. Corporate social responsibility is our gig and we can facilitate events days to motivate your team, instill environmental stewardship and support your communities. We provide our clients with professional advisory services that deliver innovative, sustainable and environmental approaches. Now please welcome Larissa Rose from Glowing Green Australia. Larissa is an energetic and resilient professional with a vast knowledge of renewable fuels, environmental management, business leadership and sustainability. Winner of the 2019 Gold Coast Women's in Business Award, Larissa is tertiary qualified and has a very broad skill set in environmental studies, carbon solutions, waste and project management and student mentoring and career leadership. She has led and facilitated environmental education programs in Queensland schools, devised sustainability programs and developed environmental auditing programs for schools and companies nationally. A career spanning grassroots engagement on the field to high level political negotiations has given Larissa an understanding of market gaps that need to be addressed to facilitate a robust renewable fuels industry. Her environmental consultancy, Glowing Green Australia, has given her experiences with business systems, leading teams, and delivering professional quality services for her clients. Larissa has represented Australia speaking on numerous global, global conference stages in the USA, Canada, Korea, Germany, and at the United Nations level. She's an adjunct lecturer at Bond University where she drives climate change and environmental management curriculum and industry stakeholder engagement. Thank you, Larissa, for sharing your very valuable insights here with us today. Welcome to the parenting session of the 2020 Sustainability Symposium. My name is Larissa Rose and I am the director of Glowing Green Australia and I am looking forward to today to providing you some content around supporting and shifting with behavioural change and the important role that parents have to shift and drive behavioural change and support schools with embedding sustainability. So we're gonna go through looking at some of those concepts and then later on, we're actually gonna move into the second half of the presentation, which is around the actual um, application and implementation of that. So we're gonna go through those concepts, what sustainability is and what that means. So I welcome you and thank you again. Um, and I hope you've got some really valuable takeaways. I encourage you to get your notepad out or your iPad or whatever format that you like to take notes on because there will be some triggers here um, that will actually start to assist you to question where you're at and your role as a parent to support schools. So let's get started. We're gonna look at understanding the value and significance of what it means in terms for schools to embed sustainability and having a sustainability plan and vision. Now, I'm gonna take you through that because I want you to sort of understand from a back door approach, helping assist you to shape up that role and the space that you can step into as a parent and a guardian um, which what I will use a lot that term is saying, instead of saying parent and guardian will be school community. So you as a school community to be able to assist and drive that change for your school. So through this process, we're gonna look at um, students' positions, where the school's at, and then where you'll start to be able to bridge that gap in connectivity on growing, expanding, and looking at how we can enable shifts and change. One thing that I think is really invaluable and important to highlight, first of all, is the symposium has four major purposeful goals. And this one aligns perfectly to exactly what we'll be talking about today, which is empowering youth to be leaders required for a sustainable future. 
So this is really around our role in duty of care for building the leaders of the future and supporting the school or the built environment and what they're wanting to enable and deliver on for the future of growth of the leaders. And that in turn reflects into the community and that community is us in our homes and us as parents and guardians, the school community, how we need to look and shift and change our actions, our behaviors, and what that means in terms for us to grow and expand, to support our students who are making significant change at a school and then coming back into the home environment. So there could be quite a segregation there. And then in turn, the role that us as a parent can have to contract that and bring that together. So valuable, purposeful goal there, that one. So we're gonna look at what that means for sustainability and giving you an understanding on that whole concept development phase, which is what we're gonna be talking about here. This is what schools will be doing and where they're at and where they're wanting to shift and make change. And then from there, we're gonna start looking at your role. And then in the next presentation, we'll move into what those actual practical applications are. I think it's really valuable and important um, for you to know um, some of the work that we do, which is to go in in the background and really support and drive these sustainability visions in schools. And then from there, a lot of this stuff is what sits behind that. So concept 101 of sustainability is schools will be looking at some key indicators of where they can make implementation of sustainable and environmental practices and change. Now, those changes are similar ones to what we can and have the capacity to do in our own home environments. And that therefore leads into us as the parents and the guardians, the school community, how we need to consider how we might need to make shifts. So the glowing R's really click on that, reducing, regulating, respecting, replenishing, refusing, and recycling and reusing. So that circular concept, because this is the backbone, what triggers initiatives and programs that schools will be wanting to embed in the practicality running of the school and the operational management of the school. And that in turn is gonna start shifting behavioral change in the students and in the teachers and in the non-teaching staff and management. And then that in turn, we don't wanna to have too much of a gap where parents are thinking one thing and the students are in another world with thinking something else. And we want to create that linkage and empower and nurture parents and all the valuable skill sets and tools that they have to be able to provide and expand that journey for a school on its sustainability endeavor. Schools making change, absolutely. How that affects us um, is, is, can be quite significant and large. So if we look at one um, process, which does, be, does become, I should say, one of the most biggest things that schools do is around waste management systems. And a lot of that culture is internal shifting and operational management change, but that can have a flow on effect as well around what that means in terms of how children bring products to school with eating and how those waste streams are managed. So we can understand if there's a cultural change within a school and there may not be so much of the same culture change within a home environment or the same methodology of thinking in regards to waste stream management, how that differential and how there'll be a bit of a clunking and a clashing there. So we've got to understand how do we work complementary and how do parents once again have a powerful leadership role to understand the nurturing of their students and the children and then also how they need to have a role in supporting that community outcome that a school is wanting to do. Give you a bit of an understanding, I've got some trigger words here which are really important to have, is giving you a snapshot of like, well, what is sustainability? Because sometimes it can just be so brushed over, we kind of think we know what it is, but I just thought I'd give you a bit of clarity around that. So it does sit absolutely with social, economic and environmental triggers, and then we call that the triple bottom line. So the principal process within that is Overarchingly, we're wanting to meet the needs of the present moment without compromising the ability of the future generations. Okay, so that is where we see that alignment between a shift in an operational built environment like a school 
and then understanding there's a duty of care to start shifting practical processes and alongside that runs that behavioral management process. Support, this is where concerted efforts towards building an inclusive, sustainable and a resilient future for our people and our planet. This is another progressive space and role that parents can have to enable and help trigger some fantastic outcomes. And then lastly, we have economic growth, social inclusion, environmental protection and connectivity. A fantastic one for us to understand the imperativeness of sustainable development goal number 11 here around that connectivity, leaning, drawing in and having the ability to be able to draw on that outside network to create optimizing outcomes within a school. So that's where we really would like to understand more and pull in and schools will do that on sustainability or SDG goal number 11. Now, next phase is taking steps towards um, change. This concept phase that we keep going on and talking about here is around understanding that when we do start building that, we're gonna have some policies and frameworks and necessity and a duty of care and a role that the parents have to play. So we'll go through that more probably a lot more in the second one to help break that down. But this, this little presentation is just to give you a further understanding on the process that's going on and then we can start identifying, well, what is that and what does that mean in terms for you? Schools developing sustainability practices. Now, this can be general, easy, quick win processes, or some schools can go into some quite substantial outcomes and trajectory goals on what sustainability means to them and in terms on how they enable that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a process that we do with schools on how they make change. And they ask some really practical questions like you can see here around understanding the depth and scope on how much they actually want to embed sustainability and how they are actually going to do that. So that's what leads to this process now. Keyword here, connect, and you'll see this at the end. So creating a sustainability committee or a group or a club is the first foremost thing that we need to do within a school. So straight away that you can understand and see what would be your role as a parent in that guardian or community leader? And what is that in terms for you to provide value to that process for a school? So embedding this is the catalyst for sustainable long-term longevity of sustainable practices in a school. The next process that we go through next is engage. So engage is the next key word. Engaging is absolutely instrumental talking piece. So we're building a sustainability vision statement here. This is going to be the ethos. This is what the school is going to talk to. And this is what's going to be instilled in every choice and process uh, and decision and program and connectivity that the school will do with other community bodies or organizations. Does this come back to our ethos or our vision statement? So all of those choices will come back to this. And this is the pillar for a school to be able to make significant change within that. So us as a parent want to understand that if this is the ethos, there's going to be quite a large role and place that us in the community can do and provide to assist a school with that. Next one is embed. So embed is really around asking those questions. We've got the vision, we've got the statement piece. Now, what is that gonna mean? This is the fun part where we start looking at what would you like to see within the school? What are some of those big goals? What are those targets? Perceptions, how do we wanna be known in the school? Who do we need to lean on in the community that has amazing skill sets that can provide extra value to supporting some of these programs, processes, trajectory goals? How are we going to actually physically engage and embed those? And what things can you do to showcase um, further school community leadership? 
So this is the process that we go through um, with schools. And then this is where you can start to see running alongside that, the role that parents have to support schools in that transition phase. Connect, engage, and embed. So I'm gonna slow that down and finish that up there. And what I really would like um, you to do in preparation for the next presentation is to really have a thinking and understanding about, well, what is my school doing that you're connected with from your child? And what does that mean in terms for me personally to be more proactive and help support a school? And then from there, what skill sets do I have to provide? And then lastly, what do I need to do and change in my own everyday beliefs and methodologies and thought processes to ensure that I can shorten that gap and create an opportunity for the school to be able to have greater streamlining in the community, but also pull across that connectivity in the home environment as well. So I look forward to bringing the next presentation. Congratulations to Sustainable Schools Network on this fantastic flipping of this event. And I hope I've been able to provide you with some value and I look forward to speaking to you soon. The history of Suez is about an ambition an ambition to support major revolutions for human progress. It's the history of hundreds of innovations that help improve mankind's health, protect the environment, and preserve resources essential for life. In 1869, Suez becomes the name of a canal. This was the inauguration of a technological feat that gathered for over 11 years the expertise of the best engineers of the time. By creating the Universal Maritime Suez Canal Company, Ferdinand de Lesseps wanted to fulfill the crazy ambition of the pharaoh's ancient dream to connect east and west by building a 160-kilometer canal between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. Since the first day of operation, the Suez Canal revolutionized world trade. The Canal de Suez is the beginning of our history. It's the beginning of our industrial adventure and the birth of our name. Suez. But it's much more than this. It's the voluntad de participar en la construcción de un mundo nuevo. De un bienestar compartido por todos que nos motiva a día a día. At the end of the 19th century, with the Industrial Revolution underway, history speeds up and the world begins its urbanization. Water, an essential resource, becomes a public health issue. Imagine, in those days, almost no one had access to running water at home. Side by side with cities, Suez plays a key role in the public hygiene revolution. Engineers innovate in the field of water services. They're able to build water and wastewater infrastructures over great distances. Since 1880, large European cities like Paris, Bordeaux, and Barcelona developed their first water and wastewater networks. This revolution in public hygiene results in fewer epidemics, a lower mortality rate, and constantly increasing life expectancy. At the beginning of the 20th century, household waste becomes the next public health issue. We've always been pioneers in waste management. In Paris, Suez invents the first ever motorized refuse collection vehicles and introduces a waste collection system using 300 traction vehicles. After World War II, metropolises emerge across Europe, America and Asia, and cities equip and modernize. Vast urban areas have to be managed sustainably and suburban growth must be supported. It's no longer enough to supply water to the city. Now it's also a question of ensuring a constant level of quality, meeting the massive rising consumption whilst avoiding wasting water and treating urban wastewater and industrial effluents. Urban growth also forces a change in waste management. Suez innovates by creating facilities capable of managing waste on a large scale. Challenges faced by countries in the north are now becoming issues for the south.
the end of the 1990s, Suez became a world reference in environmental services in Europe, the USA, South America, China, Africa, the Middle East, and shortly afterwards in Australia. On the 12th of December 2015, at the end of the COP21, the first Universal Climate Agreement was signed unanimously by 195 states and the European Union. Citizens everywhere take action for the climate and the environment and call on all players to step up their contribution. 150 years after the inauguration of the Suez Canal, a winning spirit continues to motivate all the group's employees. Suez is announcing a new ambition to shape a sustainable environment now with cities, industries and citizens. Sustainable solutions enable our customers to have a positive impact on climate and on the planet's natural capital. Parce que l'innovation change le monde, nous imaginons des modèles zéro déchet. We develop cutting edge technology solutions to optimize water use. Dépolluer les sols, améliorer la qualité de l'air et rendre les villes intelligentes. Our solutions will enable our customers to avoid yearly 20 million tons of carbon emissions by 2030. 100% des solutions que nous proposerons aux villes et aux industriels d'ici 2030 seront durables. Motivated by a passion for the environment, the 90,000 Suez employees are committed to inventing disruptive solutions to preserve and restore the fundamental elements of the environment, water, air and soil, and to shaping a sustainable environment together, now. Suez, the winning spirit. And finally, we're so looking forward to hearing from Suez Stakeholder Engagement Officer Ash Kelly. Ash is based in Victoria's largest local government area at the Hallam Road Landfill, where he delivers educational tours to help facilitate understanding in the community Suez operates in. The tours are designed to help community members gain a perspective on how our individual efforts can scale up and have a large impact. The tours demonstrate the amount of work and engineering it takes to collect, contain and manage waste and to forecast future uses for that waste. We can't wait to hear what Ash has to say. Hi, I'm Ash. I work at Suez as a stakeholder engagement officer. Like many people, my workplace looks a bit different right now. I'm usually based at Suez Hallam Road Landfill, situated in the middle of Victoria's most populous municipality. A big part of my role is to deliver educational tours of sites of Suez in Victoria to the local community to help understand the importance of proper waste management. Across Australia, Suez has more than 100 sites and facilities that focus on getting the most value out of waste and giving it a second life wherever possible. We also work with water utilities to deliver drinking water and to treat waste water. Our goal is to change the way people think about their water and waste and move away from a linear model of consumption where we simply make something, use it and then throw it away. And to move towards a circular economy where it, we are extracting as much as possible from every single product, part and material. Over the next 15 minutes, I'll be sharing some of the exciting things Suez is doing to help shape the sustainable future. I hope by the end of this session, everyone is a bit more aware, equipped and inspired to do their part when it comes to waste and recycling. This hierarchy tool, which is used to rank waste management options according to what is best for the environment. You may have seen slightly different versions before, but the purpose of this session, I'll be using this hierarchy, which includes reduce, reuse, recycle, recover, and finally dispose. Now more than ever, we all seem to be quite concerned about the food we are wasting at home. So here are some very practical tips to help you reduce your food waste at home.
the issue is not just food wasted at home. Before food arrives at our supermarkets and restaurants, there are a lot of surplus food. 4.1 million tonnes, in fact, of surplus that's produced by our Australian farmers and manufacturers go into waste. Please take a look at this video. As you know, Yumi is a very innovative startup company. And uh, I'm standing here next to Katie Barfield, who is the founder and CEO of Yumi, who has launched this fantastic sustainable project and company to, in order to avoid food waste. Well, as you can see from the enormous truck behind us, um, it is a mammoth food waste mountain that we need to climb. So 4.1 million tons of food goes to waste in Australia every single year, and that's 560 of these semi-trailers that is full of food that goes to waste every single day. The reality is that food becomes waste in the commercial sector for so many different reasons. It might be that the potatoes are too small, the carrots are too wonky, the tin is a bit dented, there's a misspelling on a package. It can be for a variety of reasons, and it is the unseen side of food waste that no one is talking about. That is not a problem that we can solve alone, and therefore we have partnered with Suez to provide an integrated solution for food manufacturers and farmers across Australia that will see the end of this type of waste. And to date, we have returned over $5 million to Australian farmers and manufacturers, making it a more viable industry. And that's what we're all about. And this is very close to our heart at Suez, where we fully uh, underline and subscribe to the uh, Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations in order to try to avoid, uh, I'd say, uh, unsustainable uh, production and consumption of, uh, of food. And this is very close to our values and our purpose, so we are extremely excited to partner with Yumi today. Where avoiding re and reducing waste is not possible, the next most preferred option is to reuse or recycle the materials. By reusing or recycling, we're decreasing the need to create new materials. However, when it comes to recycling, we often get many questions around what we can and can't go in the yellow bin and what needs to go in the waste bin. I've tried to tackle some of the most common questions with what I've had on hand in the next video. Hi, I'm Ash from Suez. Um, I just wanted to share some recycling tips in uh, these times where we're all in different circumstances with our work and um, life. Um, so uh, me and my housemates were all coffee lovers in this house. Um, we can't use our keep cups anymore, so we've got a few takeaway cups. Um, this cup itself um, would have to be put in uh, the waste stream, in the curbside waste, because um, it doesn't have a recycling logo, and the materials that insulate the cup and keep the coffee from coming through the cardboard um, has a plastic lining, and that can't be separated. So the best thing to do with that sort of cup would be to put that in the um, curbside waste. We also have a cup um, from another cafe that has a biopack um, uh, recycling compostable lid. Um, I've been asking uh, our waste streams about this at our organics facility. Um, that facility said that the uh, compost of uh, these lids actually takes quite a long time and can impact their, their process. So um, until this um, technology is improved, it would be better to also put this in the um, waste stream. Um, and I guess over time that um, process would actually be composted in the landfill. So it'll degrade. To reduce our uh, necessity to travel down to the shops, we've put our soft plastics in um, one big bag so that means that um, when me or one of my housemates go to the shops, uh, then we can dispose of these soft plastics, uh, which can't actually be put in our regular home recycling bin. So uh, we're clearly coffee lovers in here. So uh, another option for um, coffee, if you're, you wanna make your coffee at home, you can take the coffee out of the filter, like so. And um, we've got our a lovely little indoor plant here that we have been putting the coffee grounds um, into to make sure that we're not just um, disposing of these like in uh, your normal waste. So there's one that you can actually see that we've done prior. 
Did you know that Australians generate 48 million tonnes of waste every year? With 23 million people living in Australia, that's more than two whole tonnes of waste per person. The average recycling rate is 60%, which means 40% of waste is still being sent to landfill. Every day, natural resources like wood and fresh water and raw materials like oil and iron ore are used to make items that we use and throw away. Recycling lets us reuse these materials in new products and packaging and gives waste a second life. Each year, Australians save 15 million tonnes of CO2 by recycling their waste. That's the same as taking 3.5 million cars off the road. By changing your recycling habits, you can have a positive impact on the environment and the economy. The next part of the waste hierarchy is recover, which is utilising the remaining waste to create energy. Here is an example of energy from waste facility in the UK. At Suez, our energy from waste facilities in the UK take residual waste left over after recycling and process it under controlled conditions to produce electricity and heat. The electricity that is produced is fed into the power grid and each facility can power thousands of local homes. The heat produced can be piped to nearby businesses and the remaining ash, which is created as a byproduct of the process, is collected and used as an aggregate in road construction. Our facility in Suffolk processes 269,000 tonnes of waste a year from households and businesses and generates electricity to power 30,000 homes. Using the energy potential in residual waste is better for the environment than sending it to landfill, as well as offering a cost-effective solution to managing waste. Energy from waste can divert in excess of 95% of waste from landfill. Suez Energy from Waste facilities have on-site education centres, where school groups and members of the public can also learn about sustainable waste management. With experience in operating more than 60 energy from waste facilities across the world, Suez is currently exploring opportunities to develop energy from waste facilities around Australia. Suez Resource Co is celebrating production milestone of 1 million tonnes of alternative fuel generated by the Wingfield facility. In the process, diverting more than 2 million tonnes of waste from landfill. The Wingfield facility uses world-leading technology to harness the energy value in construction, demolition, commercial and industrial waste. This waste, otherwise destined for landfill, is transformed into baseload fuel for use by Adelaide Brighton Cement. The facility, the first of its kind commissioned in Australia, has helped reduce annual greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to the electricity supply of 50,000 homes. The cement produced by Adelaide Brighton, using fuel from the Wingfield facility, is then used in a host of major infrastructure projects across South Australia, including the recent development at Adelaide Oval. The final piece in the waste hierarchy is dispose. When we can't reduce, reuse or recycle, our waste is finally disposed in a landfill. At our landfills, we have smart cells, which produce enough electricity to provide more than 47,000 homes with power, making the smart cells Australia's largest producer of biogas for the production of renewable energy. Here's a quick video to show you how they work. The rising population and increasing density in our cities will force us to consume more and more energy and raw materials than ever before. The scarcity of natural resources is a global challenge, which Suez is facing head on, creating new and innovative ways to ensure towns, cities and industries across Australia have the essential resources they need today, tomorrow and into the future. Suez, a pioneer in waste management technologies, uses smart cells, a sophisticated, highly engineered alternative to traditional landfill. Smart cells work like a giant battery, generating biogas, which is harnessed into electricity. 
biogas is created when the organic matter in waste breaks down. Rather than being released into the atmosphere, smart cells capture this natural gas using a system of connected biogas wells, which transport the gas to power stations to be converted into electricity and fed into the surrounding power grid. Each year, Smart cells produce enough electricity to power over 47,000 homes, making Smart Cells Australia's largest producer of biogas for the production of renewable energy. Every day, harmful emissions are released into the atmosphere. Smart Cells give you the power to create a better tomorrow, replacing non renewable fossil fuels like coal and gas with a renewable energy source. At Suez Recycling and Recovery, we put your waste to good use. We use smart and reliable solutions to convert waste into valuable resources. We hope this has deepened your understanding of sustainable practices and furthered your hopes into the future. Please feel free to visit our website or social media channels for more information. Thank you for watching. Stop so gonna get on the ride Twisting and turning through life No matter how rough it gets I'll get by Home moves with me where I roam It's in every dream I make my own I'm never alone I know that every day Will always bring me something new oh.